on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Edward Said, professor of modern Arab studies and history and authors of, uh, author of Brokers of Deceit, How the U.S. Has Undermined Peace in the Middle East, Rashid, Professor Rashid Halidi. Uh, professor, welcome to the program. Thanks so much. So I, I want to start, um, uh, you have a piece in, in Alternate uh, that, is, uh, that has uh, come out today, uh, and um, I, I, there was actually an incident that, um, uh, I think it was last night, uh, that ABC News had uh, shown footage of uh, Palestinians uh, essentially standing in front of rubble, uh, trying to recover from... Uh, uh, Israeli uh, uh, missile attacks, and mm -hmm. uh, Diane Sawyer had, um, I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt, accidentally identified um, these people as Israelis <clears throat> recovering from, uh, from uh, rocket attacks, uh, allegedly right. uh, Palestinian right. rocket attacks. And I thought this was a, 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 an interesting metaphor for uh, what you discuss in your piece about the, mm -hmm. the, the red herrings um, that this uh, Israeli assault on Gaza will, will produce. Uh, uh, tell us what you mean by that. Well, I think that the, the piece you're, you're me you mentioned, which I, I also heard about, is a perfect example of what I was trying to point to in my piece, which is that we tend to get an obsessive focus on, focus on Israeli suffering. It's not surprising that you should assume that, that people who are standing around debris are Israelis because we hear so much about rockets. Now, a lot of rockets have been fired from Gaza. Most of them are not guided missiles. They are fired in the general direction of a target. And uh, they're not very accurate. They can be lethal, of course. As of this moment in time, fortunately, not one single Israeli has been wounded or killed. There's been, a, there's been some damage. Um, by contrast, what Israel has been doing in over 800 air raids uh, in the last few days has been to destroy about 150 homes. So we're not talking about semi-guided or poorly guided missiles. We are talking about very heavy bombardment by the most sophisticated weaponry in the world, American weaponry, in fact, American Apache helicopters, American F-16 fighter bombers, and so forth, uh, of, a, of an area of, a, of about 350 square kilometers with 1.8 million people. And necessarily, there are going to be a lot of civilians killed, as there have been so far. Uh, and necessarily there's going to be a huge amount of, of damage. None of this seems to penetrate in a situation where, obsessively, we are told it is the Israelis who are the ones who are under this terrible, terrible burden of the rocket fire. And I'm sure psychologically it's a, it's a burden. But the, the weight of fire that's coming on Gaza is many, many times the weight of fire that's going at Israel. And the casualty figures, I think, illustrate that. Several hundred people wounded. Uh, and uh, about 80, uh, 80 plus killed uh, in Gaza so far, and so far, mercifully, not a single Israeli wounded or killed from the rocket fire. And, and we should say that um, uh, the reports I've seen, at least 14 or 15 uh, of that 80 uh, plus figure that I've seen reported as well, are are children, uh, mm -hmm. including including toddlers. And yeah. Um, the uh, there have been um, uh, at least online uh, release of photos that have been deemed too uh, too brutal, uh, frankly, to be seen on American television, uh, and of course uh, these are of uh, Palestinian uh, children and uh, and adults uh, who have been killed in these in right. these raids, and and, and well, so, uh, continue. No, I mean, American television has a convention of not showing bodies, and I think that's understandable. I, I, don't, I wouldn't argue with that. But there's no reason that they couldn't cite numbers. Uh, there are 2,000 killed, children killed a month, every month going back to 2,000. Two children a month. 1,400 Palestinian children have been killed. You don't have to show their pictures. You can just tell people two of these little kids are dying, some of them teenagers, some of them toddlers, some of them 10-year-olds, and so forth, every single month as a result of... None of them engaged in any kind of hostile activity. Um, this is Defense for Children International in Palestine that produces this statistic. Nobody's ever challenged it, but the, the sad thing is we get a great deal about Israeli suffering. We are never told these things. Leave the pictures aside. I, I personally think it, it, that kind of atrocity photo probably is not a good thing to have on television. But I don't see why we can ha can't have reporting of these sort of basic facts. 
Well, I mean, why why don't you think we have uh, a reporting of these these basic facts? I can tell you to uh, a, a specific number how many people were shot in Chicago uh, over the past five days. Uh, right. Why why don't you think we have these uh, these figures? Well, one of the one of the reasons is that Israel and its supporters are are quite. Uh, I think I have to use this word again. Obsessed with the idea that Israel is a victim. And that Israel, uh, uh, Israeli suffering somehow is different and more important, deeper uh, than anybody else's suffering. Um, it also fits into a narrative where there's no background and there's no context, where the kind of situation the Palestinians are in in a day-to-day basis, as compared to the kind of situation Israelis are in on a day-to-day basis, is never really compared. I mean, Israelis obviously have various burdens as a result of their occupation of. Uh, the, the West Bank, their, their control of the Gaza Strip from without, and, and their domination of East Jerusalem. But they don't go through the kind of daily hell that Palestinians moving from one place to another, from say Ramallah to say Jerusalem, have to go through as a result of occupation. And so there's a sense that any time any Israeli suffers, this is, this is something to be, to be focused on, whereas the day-to-day grinding humiliation uh, that the Palestinians endure as a result of 47 years of occupation just doesn't ever seem to be brought to anybody's consciousness. There, in, in a certain sense, Israeli news is local news in the United States. I mean, just as you mentioned, the death toll, I, Mayor Emanuel mentioned it just the other day, I noticed it in the New York Times, it's local news in the United States, what happens in Chicago. What happens to Israelis is also treated as local news. It's, it's uh, something that connects up with people's lives. I noticed when uh, a young boy was brutally beaten uh, with the footage available worldwide, including in the New York Times, who happened to have family in Tampa, the, so- the story suddenly became a local story in the United States. And that too rarely happens. And many, many, many Americans have relatives in Israel fewer have relatives who are Palestinian. So I think that's part of the reason. And, and so, I mean, give us a sense, I mean, you know, if you could, uh, of what that daily life is like. I mean, what, when we talk about uh, 1.8 million people in a, um, I, I don't know how many kilo, uh, kilometers. 360 uh, square kilometers, if get, you're talking about the Gaza Strip. Give us a sense in the context of, uh, of a, a United States city, if you will, um, uh, so that people can can begin to appreciate just exactly uh, what the situation is there, because I think you're absolutely right. I think I think um, uh, the um, w- when we see images of uh, of people in Israel, when we see people uh, sitting at cafes in Tel Aviv, uh, there is a sense like, oh, this is like um, this is like Houston, or this is like they're uh, like us. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's something that's been very well marketed by Israel. Israel is like us, like Americans, whereas the Palestinians are other or different or weird or peculiar, it, not to say dangerous and fanatical and so on and so forth. Well, uh, give well us, uh, give let, a, let me give you two, two senses. I, it, it's impossible to give a sense of what Gaza is like. Gaza is an open-air prison. People can't go in or out. The overwhelming majority of Gazans have not been out of Gaza for years, so many, many years in most cases. Um, so it is an open-air prison, 360 square kilometers. Um, it's a little bigger than Manhattan, but not much. Uh, I don't know the I don't know the size of Manhattan to tell you the truth. But I've been to the Gaza Strip, and you drive from one end of the other to the other. It doesn't seem to me much longer than the distance uh, from the Battery to to uh, Inwood. Um, another instance I can give you is the largest Palestinian city, the largest city with an Arab population uh, in the entirety of Israel Palestine, is occupied Arab East Jerusalem. To get there. Even if you have the right papers, which I do, I'm an American citizen, uh, takes an hour, hour and a half just to get to the checkpoint at Kalandia or the other checkpoints if you take another one. I was there last month, and for various reasons, I was staying with my brother who, who lives in Ramallah. For various reasons, I had to go to Jerusalem four times in, 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 in nine or ten days. And it was a torture just getting into and out of the city, and no, nothing particular happened to me. The problem was the weight, the extraordinary security uh, which is which is a function not of protecting Israelis. There are Israelis all over the place who are not protected by that. Uh, they they're all over the West Bank. They settle there. There are, are six hundred thousand Israeli settlers in the West Bank. It, it is simply to cut Jerusalem off from its hinterland to make it difficult for Palestinians to live there, with the objective of ultimately driving them out. Um, so it, that's an example. If, you, if to get from, I mean, when when governor. <laughs> 
Quentin, the bridge, when the George Washington Bridge was closed, uh, but for, for supposed traffic, uh, whatever, people went ballistic that they had to spend an hour and a half on the George Washington Bridge getting from New Jersey into, into, into Manhattan. Uh, that's what it's like every single day, every day for every Palestinian trying to get into Jerusalem or trying to get, into, uh, trying to get through any one of these major checkpoints. So that's another example. Gaza is one case. Getting in and out of Jerusalem is another case. All right, so let's, I mean, let's, let's turn to the, um, uh, to the sort of the, the, the broader issues and the contextualization, and, 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 and I want to get your sense um, of what, I mean, I think there are more and more voices, uh, both within um, the Israel, Israeli population and um, within the United States, who are uh, coming to the conclusion, and uh, you know, it, it seems somewhat obvious, but it, but it, but they are coming to the conclusion that the the current dynamic and the ongoing dynamic that has been years in upon you know decades in in the making um, that this uh, cycle of Israel uh, essentially uh, finding a pretext to pound. Uh, um, uh, Gaza and uh, the West Bank. Um, we're, I think, we're on the verge of perhaps a, um, uh, a an invasion, a ground invasion into Gaza uh, by the Israelis, um, and one which I think um, Israeli military personnel have said is, you know, expect this to last a a, a long time. Um, Th this dynamic is unsustainable, and and, and so from mm -hmm. your perspective, what what is what is possible? I mean, what it, it, you know, many people are now saying that the the two state solution is um, that that has uh, flown the coop. Is that your sense? Uh, and if if so, what is uh, what what does a one state solution look like? Mm -hmm. Well, let me let me start with the unsustainable. I think that what's unsustainable. Um, is the continuation of this colonization enterprise, whereby Israel is is, is systematically gobbling up the West Bank? Uh, that cannot continue with the Palestinians staying silent. They will not stay silent as their land is stolen. They will not stay silent as they're cooped up more and more tightly. Israelis seem to think this go Israeli government is absolutely, fervently, totally, utterly committed to the expansion of the settlement project. That is their raison d'etre. That is their reason for being. That is, that is their, their be-all and the end-all of this government. The three main parties in this coalition are, are deeply committed to this. Um, the Prime Minister's party, party Bennett, Bennett's party, and so forth. Um, that is unsustainable. The Palestinians have rebelled against this in the 80s. The first intifada in, in the early 2000s with the second intifada. The, the second intifada was a disaster. It was an armed uprising which led to extraordinary repression, and it set back the Palestinians a great deal. I hope that they, they don't follow that path. But the point is this kind of squeezing of the Palestinians in, in furtherance of this aim of a greater Israel, which would be entirely dominated by Israelis, where Palestinians would be absolutely subjugated and subordinated. That is the objective of this government, and this is not sustainable. Uh, interestingly, one of the president's closest aides um, made a statement in Israel, a speech in Israel, which the, United, the New York Times managed not to ever mention. Uh, they mentioned him, and they mentioned <laughs> that he was in Israel, but they managed to avoid mentioning, avoid uh, quoting this quite extraordinary speech that he gave. This is Philip, um, Philip Gordon. Precisely. In, in which he basically said that, he basically said what I said. Israel confronts an undeniable reality. It cannot maintain military control of another people indefinitely. Doing so is not only wrong, but a recipe for resentment and recurring instability. That's the White House. That's the national, somebody who, who's the president's advisor in, uh, on these issues. Speaking to Israelis, the New York Times managed to avoid, avoid reporting that. Um, that's a fact. Everybody in Europe understands this. Everybody in the rest of the world understands this. I think you're right. I think people, in, many people in Israel, and increasing numbers of people in the United States, including much larger numbers of people in the Jewish community, especially younger ones, uh, have realized this. I mean, they travel there. They're smart. Uh, I, talk, I, I talk to students, students who are pro-Israeli or, or critical of Israel or somewhere in between. All of them are much clearer in understanding that this cannot go on, and that the sort of blind faith that 
the United States will help Israel forever. The sort of blind faith that the Palestinians can be duped and, and subject, subjugated. Um, they realize that this is madness. As to where you're go we're going from here, that's a very hard thing to say. You know, in principle, you could reverse the entire settlement process. You could remove 600,000 Israelis from the occupied West Bank and Arab East Jerusalem. I don't see the Israeli politician who's going to do that, but it's in principle, it's, it, it, it would be possible. If the United States would take a stand saying, this is all illegal, this has to end, settlement blocks are not illegitimate, nothing is legitimate, uh, Israel is within the, the, the boundaries in which it had on the 5th of June, 1967. That is that. That might be possible, but I, I don't see that. Ha Frankly, I don't think you. I think you agree with me. I don't think we see that happening tomorrow. That the U.S. Congress gets up on its hind legs and reverses its almost slavish uh, uh, devotion to whatever line uh, the Israeli government takes. Well, so I don't see. I don't see a two-state solution a at all. That's not the dynamic inside Israel in terms of the governing coalition. And it's not the dynamic in Washington. Uh, as to a one-state solution, well, in a way, that's what we have now. Israel is the state that dominates the entirety of the territory, whether Israel proper or the occupied territories, between the river and the sea, between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. There is only one state there. And for the foreseeable future, there's going to only be one state there. About a week ago, Netanyahu made a speech in which he sort of revealed his true intentions. He said, we're not going to withdraw. We're going to maintain a security presence indefinitely. What he meant was perpetual occupation. So uh, that is the dynamic that we're in. We're actually in a one-state solution right now. People just don't want to admit it. People don't want to uh, admit that the emperor is butt naked. And, 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 but is this, I mean, I, I get, but I, at the same time, the, the, this, at, at one point, this cycle must end, right? I mean, not, and I'm not saying, I'm not, uh, this is not, uh, this is, this is an assessment rather than a, uh, a, a demand when I say that. I mean, this is simply uh, the, the law of physics. There has been no example of a sustained repression of people that has existed forever, uh, um, as far That's as I true. know. And, uh, That's true. That's uh, true if one doesn't extirpate the other. I mean, you could have mass expulsion of Palestinians. I don't think that's going to happen. But that's one way this could end. Um, you know, colonial settler states have succeeded in the past. Didn't work in Algeria, didn't work in South Africa, but it worked in North America, Canada, United States. It worked in, in uh, Australasia, New Zealand, Australia. Um, if, you can, if you can extirpate or completely marginalize the indigenous population, drive them out or drive them somewhere else, the project could work. I don't think that's going to happen in this case. I don't think it's possible. But that's one outcome. But another outcome is that the United States finally changes its views, and Israelis are extraordinarily sensitive to the United States' uh, position on these issues. If an American government were able to change its stand on some of these fundamental issues, not just saying, you know, we're against occupation, but we're going to do something about it, we will not subsidize occupation. We will cut off all money all 501c3s that are sending money to the occupied territories. They can do that, just the department could do that tomorrow. The Treasury could do that tomorrow. The way they, they, they stop foreign transfers, they say this is not charitable donations. Uh, funding uh, uh, yeshivas in the occupied territories is not charitable. We won't, we won't allow it as a tax-deductible expenditure. Those kinds of measures uh, would make, wake Israelis up very quickly, and it would embolden the very large number of Israelis. They could potentially be a majority who are not really committed to the settlement enterprise but who are being dragged by the nose by a government, which, which is. And in fact, um, and just to, to put a fine point on that, um, we, we've quoted, or you've quoted uh, at least part of what Philip Gordon said, but we should, also, mm -hmm. we should also say that at one point he said, let me be absolutely clear that these are not threats when he is set, giving his assessment. Uh, he's saying right. the United States will always have Israel's back. That's why we fight for it every day at the United Nations, uh, where we have worked diligently to ensure Israel is treated fairly and on par exactly. with other states. Exactly. So, so they uh, the lots the, of bark but no bite, precisely. And 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 so I mean, le this is let's let's take a, a a step back at least in time. And 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 you you've obviously you authored a a book about um, about uh, the United States' role in the context mm -hmm. of of a uh, the being brokers uh, <clears throat> allegedly or supposedly brokers of of peace um, give mm -hmm. us a a sense of why that really is um, is 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 in itself a a red herring as well well it, 
it's a red herring, and it has involved a lot of deceit, in my view, because people are using terms that have been emptied of their meaning. For example, um, the United States is essentially committed to a scheme that was devised back at Camp David uh, in 1978 by Menachem Begin for so-called Palestinian autonomy. Now, if you actually read what Begin put forward back then, which really became the basis of the American-Israeli position in the negotiations in the 1990s that produced the Palestinian Authority, if you read what Begin said, he didn't really talk about autonomy for the Palestinians. They didn't really have control over anything. They weren't supposed to have control over anything. Israel was supposed to maintain control. The so-called autonomy, I mean, you, you have to put it in quotes, and you have to describe it as Orwellian language. So-called autonomy really meant Israel maintains its claim to sovereignty. Israel continues to settle wherever it wants. Israel controls security. Israel controls water. Israel controls building. And in fact, that is not only how the occupation worked up to 1977, 78, when Camp David was signed. That is how everything has worked from then until today, including after agreements were supposedly signed, which were supposed to change things. Nothing has changed. The Begin vision is the basis, that vision, which is a greater land of Israel, settle everywhere. The Palestinians can either like it or they can leave. Um, that vision is what drives, unfortunately, not just Israeli policy, but the, the, the policies that the United States has acquiesced in. If you start from that basis, you're not a broker of, of uh, you're not an honest broker. You're not helping to resolve the conflict. You're helping one side to impose its unilateral vision at the expense of another, and that will lead to what we've seen. Uh, the outbreaks of violence, some of them extraordinarily regrettable, some of them self-defeating for the Palestinians. But that's what we're going to have as long as we fail to break loose uh, from that paradigm. And has, that, has uh, the United States' role been consistent throughout? I mean, has there... Um, uh, was the uh, Clinton administration any different from the Bush administration, uh, any different from the Obama administration? I mean, when I looked at this uh, for this book, one of the things I found is that every administration, with the possible exception of that of George W. Bush, has, has come to an understanding that it really had to push the Israelis at some point in some way in order to at least ameliorate the situation, if not resolve it. But all of them ended up backing down. Um, I don't really think that George W. Bush tried very hard. He, he might be the sole exception. So there is a certain consistency in that all of them have ended up accepting the Israeli position, but interestingly enough, all of them have realized along the way that this really won't do. All of them, in other words, knew better, but were not able, different presidents, different secretaries of state, to do the really hard work that was involved in convincing public opinion, overcoming domestic opposition, pushing things through Congress, which would be required for a real fundamental rethinking of the American approach. So there has, I think, been a, been a, a great deal of consistency, going back, I think, to President Carter, actually. And, and so this uh, speech by Philip Gordon, again, um, sort of uh, captures that, um, th that uh, I guess, position uh, fairly well. This is unsustainable. Yeah. What you're doing is not going to work. But don't worry. We will never force your hand on this. Exactly. We won't do anything about it. I think that's the, uh, that's the operative thing. It's what the United States does or doesn't do that we should really be looking at. And that's the sort of tragedy here. Uh, I think everybody in Washington who's looked at this carefully, including policymakers who are very committed to the policies that they follow, know that ultimately this is not sustainable. Um, I think some of them are more deluded about this than others, but by and large they know this, but they don't dare say it. They understand that the political realities in the United States are going in a different direction. I think they're changing myself. I think that a courageous, a courageous position by a, by a, a, a new administration uh, could, could conceivably lead to a change of that paradigm, but it would not be an easy thing to do, and none of them have been willing to do it. Let's talk about the Bush administration, because my perception, um, at least uh, during, during the Bush administration, was that um, they, they uh, rather than sort of being aware uh, that there was an issue, they were quite convinced that uh, somehow this is sustainable, that, um, uh, yes. that Israel, and that they functioned... Whereas, at least, you know, to the extent that the United States was any check on unbridled Israeli um, 
uh, uh, aggression or colonization was almost a check against their uh, their worse their worse impulses uh, and and provided that for uh, the Israeli government at times when they realized they had gone too far uh, they could always rely on saying uh, it's the U.S. it's 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 holding us back. Uh, it right. seemed that almost the Bush administration functioned in the opposite way in that no, they were right. goading the Israelis on. I think you're right. I think you're right. And, and, and they made, and remember, of course, this was in the wake of 9-11. This was in an atmosphere where the United States was invading Iraq, invading Afghanistan. Um, this is an administration that had a very expansive vision of the U.S. role. And uh, uh, Israeli Prime, then Israeli Prime Minister Sharon played perfectly to his understanding of Bush's uh, psychology and managed to uh, obtain from President Bush a commitment that no American president has ever made to Israel's retention of what were of so-called settlement blocks, undefined and always expansive, um, which is the biggest major concession that any American president has made to Israel on this extraordinarily central issue of settlement and colonization, uh, dispossession of the Palestinians and the theft of their land. So you, uh, you're basically right, I think, about the Bush administration. Every other president has, has known better. I'm not sure that, including George W. Bush's father. Right. Uh, President a George H. W. Bush. Uh, he and Secretary Baker, I think, understood perfectly clearly that this situation was unsustainable. And I think they wanted to use the end of the Cold War and the war uh, against Iraq over, over Kuwait as a, as a way of sort of dragging Israel uh, into a, a, a settlement. They, they ultimately failed, uh, as did President Clinton, as did all of his successors. But I think that they, uh, pretty much every American president, going back to Clinton, I think, except George W. Bush, has understood this. Hey, what's also interesting in terms of the... But has done nothing, just to, just to finish that sentence, right. but has done nothing. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, Sorry, sense, my, well, my sense was that the Bush administration not only was not a check on things like, let's say, uh, the Israeli incursion into Lebanon, but were, in fact, uh, almost, um, uh, you know, encouraging them, I think, uh, you know, uh, to go forward. You're absolutely into, right. You're absolutely right. I mean, you may recall Secretary, uh, Secretary Rice's deathless comment. I mean, this should never be forgotten. She described the killing of, I believe it was over a thousand Lebanese, almost all of them civilians, and the destruction of a very large part of Lebanon's infrastructure. To this day, people don't have electricity part of the day in Lebanon because of the destruction of power plants back in 2006. She described this savaging of the entirety of Lebanon. I mean, it had nothing to do with Hezbollah, much of these many of these bombings. The road to Damascus was bombed. Bridges were dropped. Uh, power stations were knocked out. She described all of this as the birth pangs of the new Middle East, right. basically saying this is something that's good. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that really the Bush administration bears a, bears a very her heavy responsibility for, in fact, not just not restraining Israel, but, but in, in, in encouraging it. And, and do you think that we're still feeling the implications of that? In other words, that once that is once that uh, was not just released, uh, that but but encouraged, that it pushed Israeli politics even beyond the place, perhaps, um, which there is no return. And I, I don't know what that. Well, I, I think we passed. I think we may have passed the point of no return before that, or we may be passing it now. And I'm, I'm not sure. I think we need a little more historical distance to say when right. the when the point of no return was. Right. Okay. And 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 so, uh, let me ask you this, um, uh, which which may be slightly out of your your uh, your portfolio, but you know, we, you mentioned uh, George uh, Herbert Walker Bush, and I think James Baker mm -hmm. um, at one point had basically said, um, you know, f Israel, the Jews won't vote for us anyways, uh, which mm -hmm. I think was indicative of what the dynamics were in terms of of. Uh, 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 of the U.S. domestic uh, uh, politics regarding Israel. But it seems to me over the course of the past 15, 20 years, um, much of the, 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 I guess, the impetus to, um, to never criticize Israel has also somewhat shifted to uh, the, the Christian right in this country. And that so now you have uh, Michelle Bachman, you know, uh, or uh, Sarah Palin, or uh, uh, folks of that ilk, trying to um, to get ahead of even someone like Chuck Schumer on uh, mm -hmm. Israel. Maybe that might well, be I, hard I to do, right. but uh, I think I think you're right. I think that one thing that's happened domestically in the United States 
is that there's a generational shift taking place in the Jewish community, which used to be seen as a sort of bastion of support for Israel. And I think that in its, in its in institutional um, form, that is to say the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations and the big, big groups uh, within the Jewish community like APAC, that's still true. Right. But there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a very important shift, generational shift, uh, taking place within the Jewish community. And there are a lot of people who are very much more aware of what's going on, I think, younger people, and not willing to put up with the usual absolute pap that's fed to them uh, in Saturday school and in, in synagogues and trips to Israel and so on and so forth. They, they understand that they're being lied to, essentially. Um, and, and, and increasingly, the reservoir of support uh, for Israel in Congress has come from the states in the South and the West, where uh, evangelical Christians who are very right-wing, very much in favor of the use of force everywhere in the world, very anti-Islamic in many cases, um, are obsessive in their support of Israel for reasons that most Jews should be a little worried about. Because yes. They have a vision of, of an apocalyptic end for the Jewish people, um, which... Well, to be People fair, I think it's just two thirds. I think it's just two thirds. I think one third of us actually get to sit on the right hand side of God. Is my understanding? <laughs> uh, the rest, There's something like that. The, the rest. So my, my point is that my point is that that you're, you're you're basically right. There has been a very important shift congressionally, uh, reflecting I think changes uh, in the base of support for Israel. It's much more uh, right wing, uh, evangelical, and much less. Um, a united Jewish community. The institutions of the community still right. claim to represent and are still very conservative, very pro uh, Likud, very very supportive of settlement and occupation. But um, I don't think that represents the the bulk of public opinion or a very very large segment of the, either a huge majority or conceivably even a plurality of the American Jewish community. Yes, I th I think so. I think it's more representative of of uh, big moneyed interests, frankly, um, uh, and of they... older people. Yes. Older, of older people yes. who came to, who came to consciousness in the years after World War II, uh, traumatized by the Holocaust, uh, people who personally knew uh, people who uh, in their own families who died, uh, or people who came to consciousness in the decades afterwards when, in 1967, the idea that Israel could be annihilated, the idea that there could yep. be a second Holocaust, was brilliantly implanted in people's minds. We know now that Israel is in no danger of ever losing that war. But that is not how most Americans uh, uh, understood and integrated it. I mean, I, I, I was walking out of Grand Central Station one of the first days of the June War. I was a kid, and I saw people collecting money in bedsheets for Israel. I mean, that was an example of how that fear, that sense of Israel being an absolute ex existential danger, I think imprinted itself on the minds of that generation of people who are now in their 60s. So the older generation, not all of them, obviously, but a, a very large proportion of them, are very committed to an outlook on Israel, which is unchangeable and, and, and very rigid. Uh, that's much less true of the younger generation. Yeah, and I would say as someone who, in his uh, mid to late 40s, um, that I, I was, I think, on the cusp of that, uh, 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 of that. I mean, that was still very much a part of my religious uh, upbringing. But, uh, but let me ask mm -hmm. you, lastly, this. I mean, do you think that there is an awareness within the, um, uh, or enough of an awareness within um, uh, Israel's body politic that that is a very precarious position for Israel to be in? Because uh, we are probably a census away in this country uh, from those, uh, those, regional, those regions, uh, you know, you talk about the South and, and, and somewhat in the, uh, the, the Southwest, of, mm -hmm. of well, you know, uh, of essentially the, that element of American politics losing its power in the Congress. I mean, I think, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, most people would say that the chances of uh, them gaining the presidency uh, in, in 2016 or even uh, years uh, after are, are, are very um, slim. But um, once that turns, once that worm turns for them in, in Congress, I mean, do you, do you think there's a sense in Israel that they, that, that how precarious their situation is in terms of U.S. domestic uh, support? I think, I think that the, the people around Netanyahu who are very knowledgeable about U.S. politics uh, understand that there are changes coming. Um, they are 
contemptuous of Americans and American policymakers. Uh, 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 Netanyahu has been quoted again and again, sometimes without his knowing it, as basic or on off the record stuff that was reported, and basically saying we can we can we can twist the Americans around our little finger. I think that for the medium term, they think that they can get away with pretty much anything with the United States. And I think this Gaza, this assault on Gaza, 800 raids, uh, hundreds of people wounded, 80-odd people killed, is an example of that fact. They can basically go as long as they choose to go with American support, and nobody can do anything about it. So they think in the short term, like all politicians, and I think in the short term they're basically right, but I think that you're right, I think in the medium and long term. Uh, they should be really very, very worried. And there are voices in Israel, uh, centrist and, and center-right voices, very smart people who, say, who are looking at this and saying, this cannot go on. We really have to change course. The problem is they don't have the political clout of the, of the very powerful polit- political uh, forces that, that make up this coalition in Israel and that really dominate not just Israeli politics, but the spin machine whereby Israelis are terrified into following this kind of a leadership. Um, Israelis, you know, are smart people, but uh, like all like all people in a democratic society, uh, there they can be they can be uh, they can be fooled. Rashid uh, Khalidi, um, Edward Said, professor of modern and Arab studies and history at Columbia University. Thanks so much for your time today. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. 